So in this lecture, I will give you an application of the previous results by studying integrable operators. So we'll fix <coughs> A and B. So A will be strictly larger than minus infinity, smaller than B, smaller than plus infinity. <coughs> so we look at the interval AB, and we consider the space L2 of AB. So these are the functions defined on the interval AB, which say take uh, continuous uh, real values and whose square is integrable. So this is uh, our space X. And X is a Hilbert space. The scalar product will be given by the integral from AB fx gx dx. And it's a separable uh, Hilbert space. So we are exactly in the framework of the previous lectures. And we will define um, an operator, a linear operator in this space, which will be symmetric and compact. So let me define it. Uh, I will consider a kernel, K, which is defined from AB times AB to R. And I will assume two conditions on these. The first condition is that um, K it's continuous. And the second condition is that it is symmetric. So K ST it's equal to KTS. And with these two assumptions, I will define a linear operator in X, which I will represent by X, A. So A goes from X to X. And the definition will be, so from now on, I will represent the elements of X by X or Y or Z. And the elements of the interval AB by the letters S and T. So AX will be a function in X, which is L2. And it's defined, its value at t will be given by the integral from a, b, k, t, s, x, s, d, s. So this is the definition. And I will be assuming always assumption h1 and sometimes assumption h2. And my first task will be to derive some properties of this operator a. So I just recall here a notation. X will be uh, the space L2. We have a kernel K defined on AB times AB, taking values in R. Assumption H1 requires K to be continuous. Assumption H2, K to be symmetric. And uh, with K satisfying H1, I define this operator AX, where uh, AX is a function in L2, whose value at T is given by uh, this integral. So what I claim is the following, so lemma. So let's assume assumption H1. Then I claim that A, it's a well-defined. Actually, it's a bounded linear operator. I will also prove that A, it's compact. Then I claim that A, X, it's a continuous function. So let me represent by C, A, B, the space of continuous functions. And this holds for all X in X. And if I also assume H2, so if I assume H1 plus H2, I claim that A is a symmetric operator. So uh, I will now prove these uh, 
three properties. So let me start with the first one by showing that A is indeed a bounded linear operator. So let's go back to the definition. First, I claim that A x is well defined. So that uh, this integral here makes sense. And this is clear because um, if I take the absolute value of the integral from A to B of k s t, or t s, I'm sorry, x s d s, well, this is bounded by the property of the integral by A B, the absolute value of k s t, k t s, I'm sorry, x s d s. K, by assumption H1, it's continuous. AB squared is a compact set, so this is bounded by the L infinity norm of K on AB squared times this integral. And then by let me apply Schwartz inequality to say that this is bounded by B minus A times the integral from A to B of EX squared dS. So the square of this integral is just the L2 norm of x. And therefore, um, this is equal to b minus a times the L infinity norm of k times the L2 norm of x, which I will be represented by uh, this symbol. So since x belongs to L2, uh, this integral is finite, so it's uh, well defined. So A of x, it's well defined by this formula. So now let's prove, well, it's clear that A is linear. If you take x plus y, Ax plus y will be given by Ax plus Ay due to the linearity of the integral. So it's clearly linear. Now we have to show that it's bounded. Well, but this formula tells us that it's bounded because this is exactly um, Okay, so I, okay, so let me prove that uh, A is bounded, so we have to estimate the L2 norm of AX. The L2 norm of AX, it's given, so let me compute the square of the L2 norm. So this is um, the integral from A to B of AX T square dt. Now, uh, let's recall the definition of Ax. So this is the integral from a to b of dt. And now the square of this object, which is the integral from a to b of k t s x s ds. And this is square. Now, I will use the Schwartz inequality again inside here to bound uh, this quantity. So I still have the integral from a to b dt. And let me use the Schwartz inequality here to say that this is bounded by k t s square ds from a to b times the integral from a to b, x s square ds. Well, these are real numbers, so I can take the square. I don't need the absolute value here. So you see that what appeared here is the L2 norm of x square. This is a constant, gets out of the integral, and therefore this quantity is bounded by the integral from a to b dt, the integral from a to b ds, x t s square times the square of the norm of x. So this is finite because k is continuous. So this is bounded. And therefore, this integral here, it's bounded, say, by the L infinity norm of k 
times b minus a square and uh, with a square. So this proves that the L2 norm of Ax, it's bounded by b minus a times the L infinity norm of k times the L2 norm of x, proving that a it's a bounded operator and its norm it's bounded by the square root of this quantity. So uh, up to now we proved that a it's indeed a bounded linear operator from x to x. Now I claim that ax it's continuous if x uh, belongs to x. So to prove that ax it's continuous, um, well, let me compute ax at t prime minus ax at t. So this is, uh, by definition, the integral from a to b. And by linearity of the integral, k t s minus k t prime s x s ds. <coughs> well, k, I assumed that it's continuous. a b times a b, it's a compact set. So k, it's uniformly continuous, which means that uh, for any epsilon given, I can find a delta such that, well, if the distance between t and t prime it's bounded by delta, then ks, kt s minus kt prime s, it's bounded by epsilon, and this for all s and in ab. Right. K is uniformly continuous, which means that uh, for any epsilon, I can find delta such that if the distance between two points is bounded by delta, and the distance between these two points is bounded by delta, if t minus t prime is bounded by delta, then if the distance is bounded by delta, then the values are bounded by, the difference of the values are bounded by epsilon. So um, let's fix epsilon. We get this delta. And this means that if this distance is bounded by delta, this quantity is smaller than epsilon, and which means that we can bound um, this expression by epsilon times the L1 norm of x. And this is bounded by epsilon. Now, if I apply Schwartz inequality, remember, what I get is that this is bounded by a square root of b minus a times the L2 norm of x. And uh, well, and this proves that indeed ax is continuous because for any given epsilon, I can find delta such that if t minus t prime is bounded by delta, then this difference is bounded by epsilon times square root of b minus a times the L2 norm of x. So well, it's as small as we wish. Therefore, this proves that, um, indeed, for any x in L2, ax is continuous, which means that this kernel um, regularizes functions. It takes functions which are in L2 and turn them into continuous functions. A similar argument shows that A is compact. So to prove that A is compact, we need to consider sequence xn of elements in X, in L2, which are bounded, so such that the norm of Xn, the L2 norm of Xn, it's bounded by a constant C0 for all n. So we fix such a sequence, and we want to show that A of Xn, so that this new sequence is relatively compact. So that we can extract a subsequence which converge in L2. So let me call yn the element axn. And we just proved that yn is actually a continuous function from uh, defined in the interval ab. So what I claim 
is that as continuous functions, these functions yn are uniformly bounded, so that they, which means that there exists a constant c1 such that yn in the infinite norm is bounded by c1. This is for all n. And I claim that they are equicontinuous, equi which means that for all epsilon positive, I can find uh, n0, or I can find delta, such that if um, t minus t prime is bounded by delta, then y n t minus y n t prime it's bounded by epsilon and this for all n larger than one. So this is uniformly in n. And if I can prove these two conditions, I get that by the Arzel Ascoli theorem, we can find a subsequence nk such that y n k, so if, let me call that um, 1 and 2, so it follows from 1 and 2, and the azela ascoli theorem, that there exists a subsequence y n k, which converge in C for with the infinity norm to some y. So there exists y and there exists a subsequence nk such that y and k converge uniformly to y. Well, if it converges uniformly, this implies also that y and k converge to y in the L2 norm, and therefore we proved that A is relatively it's compact because we could find from uh, this sequence xn, a subsequence nk, such that axn, k, which is y and k, converge in L2 to some element of L2. So what I really need to do in order to prove this claim is to show that uh, this sequence yn, which is axn, is bounded uniformly and it's equicontinuous. So let me do that. So let me first prove that it is bounded, and then let me show that um, it is equicontinuous. So boundedness, um, both arguments are very easy. Actually, uh, we already proved uh, similar statements. So A x n at t, by definition, this is the integral from A to B of k, k t s x n s d s. Now uh, we use Schwartz inequality to show that this is bounded by a b k t s square d s x n s square d s. This is the square norm of xn in L2, and this expression here, it's bounded by b minus a times the L infinity norm of k square. And from, uh, so you see that here, this expression, this bound does not depend on t, so now I can take the supremum over all t in this inequality, and by taking the supremum, what I get is that the L infinity norm of AXN, and let me take, um, it's bounded. Okay, here, I'm sorry, in the Schwartz inequality, I forgot the square root. So actually, uh, I have a square root here, and I have no square here and here. So in this argument, what we proved is that the L infinity norm of AXN, it's bounded by B minus A 
times dl infinity norm of k times dl2 norm of xn. But this sequence xn, it's uniformly bounded. So this is bounded by c0, which means that indeed the sequence yn is uniformly bounded in the L infinity norm. So this is uh, my first claim. So it remains to show that yn, it's a, this sequence, it's equicontinuous. So let's fix epsilon positive, and we want to uh, compare y and t with y and t prime. So this is by definition of y n and by definition of a, the integral from a to b of k t s minus k t prime s x n s ds. Now, um, given this epsilon, we can find delta positive such that, well, since k it's uniformly continuous, such that if t minus t prime it's bounded by delta, then the supremum for s between a and b of t, k t s minus k t prime s, that this is bounded by epsilon. So let's fix this delta. And since uh, this expression, this difference here, it's bounded by delta, if I place the absolute value inside the integral, I get that this is bounded by delta. And therefore, this expression, it's bounded by delta times the integral of xn, the absolute value of xn. So this is the L1 norm of xn. So let's apply uh, Schwartz inequality to get that this is bounded. And here it's not delta but epsilon, of course, because this difference is bounded by epsilon. So let's use Schwartz inequality to bound this by b minus a times the integral from a to b of xn s square ds. And what appears here is the L2 norm of xn, and here b minus a. So this is uh, equal to epsilon times b minus, square root of b minus a, times the L2 norm of xn. But the sequence xn, it's bounded in L2 by c0. So we just proved that uh, for any epsilon, I can find a delta such that if t minus t prime it's bounded by delta, then y n t minus y n t prime it's bounded by epsilon times square root of b minus a times c zero, and this is uniformly in n. So this proves that the sequence y n it's a quick continuous, and therefore that uh, the operator a it's compact by the argument I presented at the beginning of the proof of this claim. Now, let me assume h1 and h2, and let us show that a is symmetric. So to prove that a is symmetric, we have to compute the scalar product of ax with y, where x and y are two elements of L2. So by definition of our scalar product, this is the integral from a to b of ax t yt dt. Now, by definition of a, this is the integral from a to b dt of the integral from a to b of k t s x s ds y t. So since uh, k is bounded, x and y belong to L2. You can show that um, this integral, it's, if I take the absolute values everywhere, we get a finite um, integral because, well, here this is bounded. 
the integral of x1 ds will give me the L1 norm of x. The integral of y, the absolute value of y dt will give me the L1 norm of y. And since x and y belong to L2, they also belong to L1. And therefore, um, this integral is well defined. So I can use uh, Fubini to integrate it in the order which I wish. So let me write that first as a b uh, dt ds kts xs yt. And so what I just said, I can change the order of integration because the integral is well defined. And so by integrating first in t and then in s, what appears is that, well, I have xs, which is outside, and then I have the integral from a to b of what remains, which is kts yt dt. Now I can use the fact that k is symmetric to write kts as kst. And so uh, this integral becomes the integral from a to b, ds, xs, the integral from a to b of kst, yt, dt. And what appeared here, you see this is a computed y at s. And therefore, this becomes the scalar product of x with a y. And what we get is that, indeed, the scalar product of a x with y is equal to the scalar product of x a y, which means that a is symmetric because we already proved that a is a linear operator. So we just proved that a is a symmetric compact operator on X, which is a separable Hubble space. Which means that we are exactly in the framework of uh, the previous lectures. And so let me just remind you uh, what we proved for a symmetric compact operators on separable Hilbert space. Well, we proved that there exists an autonormal basis which is countable of eigenfunctions. And so we represented this basis by xj, j larger than 1, and yk, wk, k larger than 1, where here I um, represented all eigenfunctions associated with the eigenvalue 0. And here, all the eigenfunctions associated to eigenvalues which are different from 0. Of course, this set can be empty. This set can be empty. Well, since L2, it's, not, uh, it's a non-trivial space, one of these sets has to be um, different from the empty set. And they can be uh, finite, or they can be countably infinite. So these are, um, this is the basis of our uh, space L2. These functions xj have norm equal to 1, and uh, they are eigenfunctions. So I will represent by lambda j the eigenvalue associated to the eigenfunction xj, and while the wk, as I said, are eigenfunctions associated to the eigenvalue 0. We know that they are all orthogonal, so it's a orthonormal basis, so they are all orthogonal uh, two by two. What we know also is that if the set, so let me call lambda j, j larger than one, the set of non-empty eigenvalues, or non-zero eigenvalues. So this is the set of non-zero eigenvalues. And I know that if this set is countably infinite, 
then the limit as j tends to infinity of lambda j is zero. So if this set of uh, non-zero eigenvalue is countably infinite, well, the eigenvalues converge to zero. And we also know that for all j's, the uh, lambda j is, well, the um, null space associated to the operator lambda minus a is, has finite dimension. So in other words, that lambda j has finite multiplicity, which again, uh, what I mean by that is that if you define by n lambda j the set of points x such that lambda j minus a x is equal to zero, or the eigenspace associated to lambda j, this space has finite dimension. If lambda j, again, it's a different from zero. Right? So if lambda j belongs to the set of non-zero eigenvalues. So this is uh, what we proved. So for symmetric compact operators, so this is exactly um, what happens here in this example in L2 with uh, this linear operator defined by this formula. So in particular, if you take an element x in L2, if you take an element x in L2 of AB, it can be written in this basis. So not to distinguish between the eigenfunctions associated to non-zero eigenvalues and the ones associated to the zero eigenvalue, let me call the old space WK, YK. So YK is the union, is the set of all eigenvalues, which means that this is the set XJ in my previous notation, union the set WL, L larger than one. So let me call YK um, the set, the finite or countably infinite set of eigenvalues of the operator A. And since this is an autonormal basis, we can write x in this basis. So we can express x as a finite or infinite sum of x, yj, yj. And what, is, what this is saying is that x, it's actually the limit as n goes to infinity of the partial sums. And this limit takes place in L2. So this limit, it's a limit in L2 of AB. Yj are elements of L2. X, it's an element of L2. So this sum, it's a, an element in L2. And what uh, this identity is saying is that, well, this sequence of elements in L2 converge in L2 to X. Well, what I want to uh, prove now is that if x is equal to az for some z in x, this limit actually uh, takes place, well, this sequence converge um, absolutely, which means that for, if I consider a point t, yjt, and if x can be written as az, what I claim is that this sequence converge as n tends to infinity to, um, to its value. So what I want to prove now is that provided x can be expressed as az for some z in L2, then uh, this sequence converge absolutely. And this is uniformly over t. This convergence is uniformly over t. 
So lemma, let me make precise what I mean. Take x in x such that x is equal to az for some z in x. Then what I claim is that for all epsilon, there exists n0 such that if n and m are larger than n0, and assume that m is larger than n, then the sum from n to m, so j from n to m, of x, y, k, y, k, t, that this is less than epsilon and for all t. So this is uniform in t. So I can take a supremum here, if you wish, from A to B. Which means that uh, the finite sums, the sequence of finite sums, converge absolutely as n tends to infinity, and this is uniformly over t. So let's prove that. I hope the statement is clear. So fix epsilon, positive, and what we wish is to estimate this uh, quantity by using the fact that x is equal to az. So I want to estimate a sum from n to m of x, y, k, y, k, t. So let's use our assumption, x is equal to az. So I can replace x by az. And I can use the fact that a is symmetric to have a, y, k. So this will be equal to, by using the fact that a is symmetric, that this is equal to a, y, k. So let me call lambda k the um, eigenvalue of yk. So a yk will be lambda k yk. Lambda k, it's a real number because we are on a real, well, we have seen that symmetric compact operators have real eigenvalues. So I can take it out and write that, and here, of course, this is k. I'm summing over k, not over j. And what I have is that this is x, y, k, lambda k, y, k, t. And this is not x, it's z. So this is what I have for the moment. Now, y, k, it's... Um, the eigenfunction associated to the eigenvalue lambda k. So actually, this is a y k at t. And so let me, uh, well, I need some space, so I'll have to re erase our what we want to prove. And so let me write just what we just said, so that this is sum from n to m of z y k. And what's a y k? Well, this is the integral from a to b of k t s y k of s. And so now, um, let me use Schwartz inequality to estimate this sum by the square root of sum from n to m of z y k square and here square root of and the sum of 
of the square. of this expression. Right? <clears throat> so this is what uh, we have up to now. So now it's, well, this sum it's finite because by um, the total sum by Bessel inequality, it's bounded by the L2 norm of Z. So I can make uh, this very small by choosing N and M large enough. So this one can be made small if I choose N and M large enough. So I'll go back to this one, but this one we see that doesn't pose any problem. So let's go to this one, um, which is more subtle to estimate. And the idea that we will use here is that, well, what is this integral, if you see this integral, I mean, I would be tempted at the first trial just to use Schwartz inequality here again to put the square inside, um, inside the, the integral. But if you do that, you'll be in trouble to estimate uh, this second term. So the idea here in order to be able to estimate uniformly in T uh, this expression is to realize that what appeared here is the scalar product of the function kt, which depends on s. So you fix a t, and as a function of s, this is a continuous function, therefore a function in L2. And this is the scalar product of this function with yk. So what appeared here is that, that this sum is actually equal to n up to m of the square of the scalar product of kt with yk. And if you do this, then you are in good shape because now you can say that this sum is bounded by the one in which you sum over all k. If you, bond, if you bond that by the sum of all k, what appeared here by uh, Percival inequality is the L2 norm of kt. The L2 norm square, but since we are taking the square root here, what we get is the L2 norm of kt. And the L2 norm of kt, remember, so let me write it here. Let me continue here. So this is the square root of a, b, k, t, s, square, d, s. But this is bounded by the L infinity norm of k square times b. So this is bounded by the square root of b minus a times the L infinity norm of k, which proves that the second sum, uniformly in n and m, it's bounded by a constant. So what we proved is that this expression is actually less or equal than a constant, which is this one, b minus a times the L infinity norm of k times the square root of the sum so this is uh, what we proved by this sequence of inequalities so uh, I will erase now everything and just recall this estimate in order to conclude the proof of the lemma so this is uh, the lemma we are trying to prove. We fix x. We assume that x is equal to a z for some z in x. And what we want to prove is that for any epsilon, we can find n0 such that if n and m are larger than n0, then this sum is bounded by epsilon. 
and this is uniformly over t in the interval a b. So for all t in a b. And um, what we proved up to now is that for any n and m, the sum from n to m of this expression, which we wish to estimate, it's bounded by the square root of b minus a times the L infinity norm of k times the square root of this sum. So now if you fix epsilon positive, well, you know that the infinite sum here, it's equal to um, the L2 norm of z square. So you know that there exists n0 such that if n and m are larger than uh, n0, then the sum from n to m of z y k square, that this is bounded by epsilon. So once you have this n0, you know that this sum is bounded by epsilon. Therefore, this expression is bounded by square root of epsilon. And you have exactly um, what the lemma it's claiming, you have that this sum it's bounded by a constant times square root of epsilon and this uniformly over t in a, b. So that proves the lemma, just that instead of epsilon, what we have here, it's a constant times square root of epsilon, but that makes no difference. Well, to complete this lecture, I want to um, investigate the equation, the linear equation lambda x minus ax equal to z. So I fix z in L2, and I want um, to investigate the existence and uniqueness of solutions of uh, this linear equation. And so we have a proposition, which is to restate the Fredholm alternative of the previous lecture in this context. So this is uh, the Fred Holm alternative, which we stated in the previous lecture, applied to this uh, special case. So let's assume that lambda is different from 0. And we have two uh, possibilities. The first one is that, let me represent by omega, this is the set of eigenvalues. of the operator A. So in our notation, omega is the set of lambda j's j larger than 1, and maybe 0 uh, or not. 0 if 0 is an eigenvalue. Otherwise, this is the set, omega. So let me assume that uh, lambda, which appears in this equation, is not an eigenvalue. So it does not belong to omega, and remember that I'm also assuming that lambda is different from zero. Then in this case, the proposition of the previous lecture states that there exists a unique solution of this equation. Exists a unique solution. And the solution is actually given by x is equal to lambda minus a minus one Actually, if lambda does, is different from 0 and it's not an eigenvalue, we have seen that lambda minus a is invertible, and this inverse, it's a bounded linear operator. So if lambda doesn't belong to omega, there exists a unique solution to this equation, and it's given by this expression. Now, if lambda is an eigenvalue, so I'm assuming that lambda is different from 0, but it is an eigenvalue, then, well, you might not have a solution of this equation. So in this case, there exists a solution to that equation if and only if z is orthogonal to the eigenspace associated to the um, eigenvalue lambda. Even if, if and only if z belongs to the orthogonal of the eigenspace associated to lambda. So remember, n 
of lambda is the space of O y in x such that a y is equal to lambda y. We know that this space it's a finite dimensional space because lambda is an eigenvalue, and we have seen that the eigenspace associated to lambda to any eigenvalue different from zero is finite dimensional. So this is uh, a closed linear subspace of X, finite dimensional, and um, the last proposition of the previous lecture was saying that was saying that there exists a solution to this equation if and only if z is orthogonal um, to this eigenspace. So we have a dichotomy. Either lambda is not an eigenvalue, in which case you always have a solution, or if lambda is an eigenvalue, then you have a solution if and only if z is orthogonal to the eigenspace. And finally, here, let's assume that z is a continuous function. If z is a continuous function and if x is a solution, then x is continuous. So this is a special property of the operator we are considering because we have shown that if x is an element of L2, ax is continuous. So we know that um, by a previous lemma, the first lemma of this lecture, ax is continuous. So if I assume that z is continuous, we get that lambda x is also continuous because the sum of two continuous functions is continuous. Now, since lambda is different from 0, from the fact that lambda x is continuous, we get that x is continuous. So actually, so we just proved that if z it's a continuous function, then the solution of this linear equation is also uh, continuous. And so this completes this uh, lecture. In the next one, I will consider special cases of the um, kernel K so that which are associated to um, the heat equation.